We're, we're ten, ways, 10 years through a bull market. This is, this is year 10. It started in 2002, 2003, 2002 for gold, 2003 for base metals. And I'm, I'm not qualified to talk about what I'm investing in because I'm not really an investor. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a developer. And I've, I've, I've made my career uh, building companies that, that other people want to buy. In other words, I'm trying to build things that, that you want to buy. As, an invest as investors. And of course, in, this, in a certain sense, we're on the same page. Because uh, I'm trying to build something that goes up in value and that ultimately has a happy ending in terms of being something that creates real wealth. Um, the big difference between what a developer does and what an investor does is that an investor can sell anytime you want. You can sell tomorrow. You can buy today. If you like something, it goes up. You can sell it, take a profit. If, if you don't like it, management doesn't perform, whatever, it goes down, you can sell it. But developers are long. I only sell once. And so I have a somewhat different strategy, a little bit longer term view probably than most investors. But in a certain sense, we're also on the same page. I'm really trying to build something that has lasting, real value. And so far in my career, it's been, it's been more successful than not. So I've had a good long career in this business. It's a wonderful business for me. It's, been, uh, it's very, been very profitable, very fun. People in it have been great to get to know. Uh, my, my first company back in uh, the 80s was a, a company called Equinox Resources. And I had lithium deals, and I had gallium and germanium deals, and I had a uranium deal. I had three gold, big gold projects, a couple of gold mines, and a big gold discovery a zinc deposit, a zinc mine. So I, I experimented with a lot of things. The best for me in the, that company was gold, but I certainly invested in a lot of different projects. And I love gold to this day. It's probably my favorite metal of all. It's certainly the best for a, for a junior company. In 1994, I had the fortune to sell that company, and I started Pan American Silver to build a big silver mining company, and we've, we've done that. Pan American is the second biggest silver mining company in the world today, and it's been a great run and a lot of fun although a fair bit of work. In 1994, I started a gold exploration company in Bolivia. Just a classic story, discover, develop, explore, add value, and sell. And we sold that in, two th in 1996 to build a company called Vista Gold. In 1996, I started another company, which uh, discovered a big platinum and palladium deposit in Brazil, which we sold in 1999. In 2002, I took a very formative trip to China uh, which really, for me, it was, a, it was an epiphany, and it, uh, it, 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 it meant that when I came back to Vancouver, I started Lumina Copper, acquiring a whole bunch of copper deposits, and that's been a very, very happy story uh, over the last 10 years. It's, it's been a, 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 we've invested $150 million or so, and we've now created about $1.8 billion worth of, of value. So it's been a pretty happy story. And I, and I know a lot of you have been invested in the Lumina, one Lumina company or another. 2009, of course, came along, the big meltdown. And, and finally, I became an investor. Uh, it just seemed that the value proposition was so profound that things had been so oversold. Everybody was talking doomsday, even you know, people who would otherwise have been bulls. But I was a bull, and everyone else was a bear. And if you want to make the real money, you go bullish when everybody else is a bear, and you become bearish when everyone else is a bull. That's the, that's the proposition. So I backed up the truck in 2009, and I acquired big, lumpy positions of companies like Frontera Copper, which was sold shortly after, 30% uh, of Amerigo, which is still around today. It's a great company. 20% of Augusta Resources, again, another great copper, copper company still around today. Those were all good deals. Not every investment was a home run. I, I bought 25% of Nord Resources, and it, it's, it's basically, it's, uh, it was a real dog, to, to sort of put it, put it mildly. Uh, in 2009, I also started a limited partnership with some of my partners called Lumina Capital, and we bought 20% of Ventana, Ventana Gold, at the bottom in 2009, and it was, a, again, another real home run. Ike Batista bought it for $1.5 billion the following year. And along the way, I have invested in some companies, like Kivalik, which is a uranium exploration company. Uh, we bought 20% of Blue Sky Uranium. Not all of these things work out. These are exploration speculations, and you cannot have luck on every single deal. We've bought pieces of Red, Red Eagle Mining, Keegan Resources, CB Gold, uh, and a number of private companies which are, which are going to do IPOs along the way. Uh, 
so it was a that's been a pretty happy story because we got in at the bottom. We got in right at the at the at the when the most doom was was uh, was being uh, spread around. But you could have done the same thing last fall. I mean, I was at a KC function in Phoenix, right? I was the only bull in the room. This was in October, November. Yeah, October. And if you'd bought companies that were presenting there in October, you would have been up 50% by today, in just about across the board. That's when there was a lot of bearishness. People were saying the world's falling to, to you know, falling, falling uh, to bits. Uh, they were talking about great investments at the show uh, being AK-47s and drugs, because you can always sell them. <laughs> you know, the worse it gets, the better the market is for drugs and AK-47s. That's a very good time to be a long, you know, be, be long, uh, when you're, when you're, or buy, when, when, when that sort of uh, attitude is happening. So, but for me, not being a real investor, being a developer, the, the biggest gains have been when I've been able to get a property that's a good property, a real property, that has a substantial likelihood of becoming a big mine, and doing the, the usual stuff. For us, it's, we call it the cookie cutter business. It's just taking a property, de-risking it, exploring it, trying to make it bigger, doing some economic uh, numbers by credible consultants that show that it has a lot of value, uh, taking away various risks. They could be social risks, they could be political risks, they could be metallurgical risks. Basically de-risking it, wrapping the property up in a nice box, tying a beautiful bow around it, and selling it. And it's worked for me, uh, I'm gonna say eight or nine times in my career, and it's just been great. You sell only once, and you always sell at a peak price, a premium price, because you've de-risked it, and you've offered it to a company that doesn't want to take the risk, but is prepared to pay more for less risk, and then build, build mines on these properties. So along the road, um, for me, the, the principles that I've, uh, I've lived and have done well on have been things like, you know, firstly, get your timing right. You, you, it's, it's a lot easier said than done, but, but of course, an incoming tide floats all boats. An outcoming tide sinks all boats. You can have a genius running a company, and if, a, if you have a bear market like happened in 2008, 2009, he's gonna look, he, the, the stock is gonna go down. It doesn't matter who it is, what kind of quality of property, the, the stock's gonna go down. And conversely, if you have a wonderful run like we've had for the last 10 years in, in this super cycle that we're living in right now, every stock will go up. You just have to get long and then stay, stay long through the piece. And try to ignore these little road bumps that have come along, like happened last fall, and like happened in 2008 and, and, uh, and, uh, and 2009, which I call road bumps. And I think in hindsight, they have been road bumps. They're not the end of the world. The world goes on. More people are born every day. Con countries are, are, are monetizing. People are moving from villages to cities. This is a long-term trend. And it's a profound secular event in our lifetime that's happening right now driven by China, and I'll talk a bit more about that in a few minutes. Another principle is think for yourself. You know, read the usual stuff. Read the Wall Street Journal, read the Financial Times, watch the, you know, the bubble vision on TV, but sit back and take your own view. As I said, the real money is when you're buying when everybody else is selling, and you're selling when everyone else is buying. Think for yourself. Go against the maddening crowds, and you'll do well. The other thing that I've done that's succeeded for me is, and it, it really has been important in my career and important in my investment world, is, is to travel a lot. Um, you're a pretty well-traveled group by and large, but I always recommend to people, and I, I recommend this to all my board of directors, do the eye trip. Now, you, you won't know what the eye trip is, but here's the trip. Take a week out of your life. Tomorrow, if you have any, how many of you own Pan American or Altera or Lumina Copper or Anfield Nickel? Those are my four public companies today. Ah, a lot of you, but not nearly enough. <laughs> okay, for those who don't own it, buy it. And for those who own them, sell a few shares tomorrow. Sell five or $10,000 worth and, and use that money and do the eye trip. And the eye trip consists of this. Let's start in New York. You could start in Toronto, you could start in Vancouver. Start in Ape City, start in New York. Take an Emirates flight to Dubai. That's the first eye. You get to Dubai, leave New York in the evening, you get to Dubai the next day around six o'clock at night. Go to your hotel, get a nice hotel, and uh, enjoy the nightlife of Dubai. It's a very dynamic place, a very amazing place. It's the, it's the capital of, of, of the Gulf right now. Uh, 
The next morning, get up early. You're working, don't forget. This is a one-week work trip. It's going to cost you about 10,000 bucks if you fly business class. Maybe if you can get a good price around the world to get one-way ticket around the world. That's what you want. In the morning, jump in a cab at about 8 o'clock and ask the guy to drive you around Dubai for four hours. That's all you need. You'll see the whole city, the whole principality, the whole emirate in four hours. And he'll deliver you back to the, 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 the airport in the early afternoon. And then you get on a plane and you fly to Mumbai. That's the second I. Mumbai is the dynamic center of what's going on in India today. And if you go to Mumbai, just like in Dubai, you will blow your mind of what's going on there. The resource consumption, the economic development, the prosperity, the... Dubai was a sleepy little sand-infested village, fishing village, 20 years ago. And today it's an unbelievable, thriving, dynamic city environment with humongous... Uh, growth and, and, and it's all about commodity consumption. So that's, that's the theme here. Mumbai is the same thing. If you'd been to Mumbai 20 years ago, you wouldn't recognize it today. Skyscrapers absolutely everywhere, thriving, dynamic city that's powering India into the 21st century. So do the same thing. You get into, you get into Mumbai in the afternoon, enjoy it in the evening, that's day two. You're on day, day one is flying, day two is Dubai. You get to, get to Mumbai at the end of day two and spend the night there, have a nice night, Indian food's great, Mumbai culture's fabulous. The next day, do the same thing. Get up early, take a cab around Mumbai, and he'll deposit you at the airport later that day, and there you fly to Shanghai. Direct flights, there's probably four a day. That's the, that's the third I, Shanghai. You get to Shanghai the next day, that's day four. You get there in the morning, rent, take a taxi, and cruise around Shanghai. It's an incredible place. You will blow your mind again with what's going on in China. It's a microcosm of China, that city. It's, it, it, the same thing's happening all over China, but in Shanghai, you're gonna see more cranes than you've ever seen in your life. And you've got a lot of culture there now. You go, go and see the Bund, it's an amazing place. The Shanghai Museum's fantastic. It's a great place to see it, but you're gonna come away with an impression of what's actually happening in real time in Asia, in the Middle East, and in India, which are three of these enormous centers where you hear this sucking sound of commodities coming in. And that is a good thing for my business, resource, de resource investing and resource development. Stay an extra day in Shanghai, that's day five. And then take a flight back to New York, nonstop flight if you want, or take stop through Seattle or Vancouver. That's your seventh, sixth day. And if you take an extra day, you're on seven days. So it's a one week trip, I highly recommend it. It will, it will change your focus of what's really going on. You will not become America-centric anymore. You will not become Eurocentric. You will actually understand what is driving this super cycle that we're in right now and what has driven it for the last 10 years. It's a great thing to happen. Asia is truly a, a story of, of my lifetime. If you, if you realize the seven, seven, six or seven countries in, in Asia, uh, China, India, and, and, and a handful around South Korea, Taiwan, Today, there's about three and a half billion people in those countries. So over half, about half the world's population. GDP right now, it's about 15 trillion, and that's about a quarter of world GDP. By 2050, the likely scenario is these, these same small number of countries, seven countries, will have over half of the world's GDP and about 90% of, of the global growth. And this will drive continuing massive commodity consumption for decades. So this is a long-term deal we're in, a super cycle. Urbanization in Asia, you'll see that if you do that trip. Urbanization is proceeding at a rate that is unprecedented in history. Asia's urban population is expected to double to, 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 double to, about, to about 3 billion from, from 1.6 billion today, the urban population. China is building 36 million housing units today, this year, on top of tens of millions built in recent years. So by 2025, China will have more than 200 cities with populations of more than a million. Now, how many of you can even name five of these? Think of it. That's what's driving world commodity consumption. China today consumes 45% of the world's coal, 30% of its iron, 46% of its steel, 50% of its cement, 38% of its copper, and 33% of its aluminum. It's the world's largest automotive market. It produces 16 million cars a year now. This is up from just a few million 10 years ago. China's middle class is expanding so quickly it will soon be larger than the entire population of the United States. It's now the second largest oil consumer with 
of the growth in oil demand. Now these are big numbers. These are really, really big numbers. And that's what's driving the super cycle. That's what's driving my business. That's why copper prices went from 70 cents a pound in 2003 to four dollars a pound and in the crisis in 2008, 2009, copper went down to $1.60 because everybody just sold and nobody was buying anything. People were destocking off of inventories. And then right away, by the next, uh, I think it, it hit a bottom in March 2009, by June or July, it was right back up to $3 plus, and it hasn't looked back. And, and that's what's driving these metal prices. I don't think these numbers in China can be sustained. I don't think there's enough metal in the world to sustain that kind of growth. So what's the result? There isn't enough copper. We cannot build copper mines quickly enough to meet that insatiable demand. We cannot have historic rates of growth of 24% per year in these, in, these metal, uh, in these compound annual growth rates. There just isn't enough copper, and there isn't enough copper or zinc or aluminum that can be built to satisfy this, this incredible Asian demand. So the result is going to be higher prices. Higher prices is about the only thing that can choke off that demand and slow it down. And that's a very good thing for people like me. It's a very good thing for people like you who are investing in resource stocks. And it's going to be across the board. It'll be, it'll be all metals. It'll be all commodities. It'll be agricultural commodities. It'll be precious metals, base metals, non-ferrous metals, uh, oil and gas, and so on. So, so I'm very, very bullish, and, and those are some of the reasons why I'm bullish. Uh, and I do listen to the, the negative arguments. Uh, there was a fellow, I forget his name. Um, no, <laughs> yeah, Doug, yeah, Doug, Doug, well, he can't help himself. Uh, who is the guy who was the, the bear on, uh, on China? Yeah, uh, you know, he's so lucid, he's so eloquent, he's so, he's so, uh, he just seems like such an expert. And I listened to him and I thought, no, that's a beautiful speaker, you know, he, he but I just didn't buy it. I'm sorry, I didn't buy it. I, I, his thesis was that the party's over in China. It's, it's the party's over. And I just say, you know what, I look at the copper price and the aluminum price and I'm saying it's not over. And uh, I've been a, a great believer in the super cycle now for 10 years. I, I was the only bull in the room last fall. Uh, I think events in the last four months have not proven the bears to be quite right, although they would say, well, it's coming still. But, you know, yeah, Doug's been doing it for 30 years. All I can say is I'm, I'm not going to stop being a, a bull. Uh, and so far, I've been more right than wrong. Uh, having said all of that, you know, the rules to investing, Casey's got those right. You follow the people. That's, that's the best lesson you can follow, I think, in, 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 in any resource business. People just sort of somehow, I have been lucky, and I've been lucky again and again and again. And I can't explain it. It doesn't seem to me great rocket science, but it's been, I've been lucky again and again and again. Uh, Lucas Lundin's group is lucky again and again and again. Hunter Dickinson, lucky again and again and again. Mark O'Day is a great rising star. He's going to be lucky again and again. The guys to follow, if you had invested in the Casey's Explorers League companies six months ago, you'd be up 50%, maybe 100% by now, um, in, in, in a fairly bearish environment. So I, I'm a big, big, big uh, fan of, of Doug Casey's stock recommendations and Explorers League companies, even if I perhaps differ on the, uh, on the macro trends of the world. So, so just to cycle through a few things uh, that I'm buying right now, or that I like, uh, and I'll start with metals. Uh, I, I do like copper. Fundamentals are great. Inventories are going down. Supply can't change quickly. Big deposits can't be built as quickly as they used to be able to. Uh, there's social grief, there's, there's technical grief, there's higher taxes in all kinds of countries, higher costs. All of this is slowing down the performance, the supply response to high prices. And it'll keep prices higher for longer. Add on this continuing demand growth in Asia, you're going to see continuing strength in copper. There just isn't enough supply, and it's one metal the Chinese do not have. They have a lot of other things. They have a lot of rare earth metals. They have a lot of tungsten and tin and zinc and lead, a fair bit of silver, uh, a fair bit of molybdenum. So those are metals that I don't like as much because if they can produce it, they will. But they don't have copper and I like copper and so I'm very bullish on the medium long-term trends in copper. I love gold. Gold is a great metal. All the chaos we've seen in the world, monetary markets, it's a monetary metal of course uh, and I'm very, uh, very uh, bullish on the prospects for continuing strength in gold. 
uh, driven by investor demand as an offset to paper, which is becoming less and less valuable. In that sense, we're on the same page exactly as, as I think the Casey Group. Silver, I'm, I'm very mixed on silver, quite frankly. I call it the schizoid metal because he doesn't really know what, it's, what it is. Is it, is it money or is it, is it industrial metal? And the truth is it's both. So if you have a scenario where you have a strong economy, strong uh, industrial growth, plus a certain amount of fear about, about countries devaluing their currencies, silver's gonna outperform gold. It will. It'll be, it'll be stronger than gold and less, and, and so it'll be silver, gold, and then industrial metals. But if you have a scenario where industrial demand is going down because the world has fallen into a global recession, if, 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 if the Casey bears are right, if that happens, Silver's not going to do very well because it's an industrial metal, and that's just the way it is. But it will do well as a precious metal. So it will be gold, silver, industrial metals in that respect. And, and so you've got to kind of take a macro view, but the fundamentals for gold are really, really good because the supply of gold is constrained. And always remember, it's got, you've got to look at demand, and you've got to look at supply for every metal. And for gold, you know, the price has gone up five times, right, in the last few years? Most things, be it, you know, cars or, or just about anything, law of economics is the price goes up, the demand goes down, and the supply goes up, right? And what happens is the price comes down again. And you're not seeing that with, with gold or with copper. In fact, if you look at the amount of money that has been spent on gold exploration in the last 10 years, it's gone up pretty much as a linear relation to the gold price. So as gold prices have gone up, more and more money has gone into gold exploration, and it's an inverse relationship when you look at discoveries. As the gold price has gone up, there have been fewer and fewer discoveries through the last 10 years. Some people would call it peak gold. Uh, it probably is. I think the, the, the decade of Peak copper is for sure behind us. Peak copper was in the 1960s. There were more discoveries that decade than have ever been made since then. Uh, a lot of our deposits in aluminum copper have been deposits that were discovered in the 60s. They were just uneconomic then. In gold, I think the peak decade for gold discoveries was probably 1980s, where there was a lot of gold discovered that is even now coming into production. So more money goes in, the price goes up, we're finding less, and that's a really, really bullish long-term uh, long-term uh, supply reality for the, for the price. That'll keep gold prices higher for longer. Uranium, I love uranium. Uranium also has strong supply side reality. Uh, uh, the ending soon of the, uh, of the uranium enrichment program in 2013, right, Amir? 2013, that's gonna take about 20% of the uranium supply off of the market. And, uh, and, and countries are building uranium reactors left, right, and center. So uh, demand side's good, supply is constrained. You've, got a, you've had a meltdown last year in, in, in Fukushima that depressed the prices of these companies. It's a great, great time to buy uranium stocks. And I predict uranium prices will, will go up and uranium stocks will go up accordingly. I'm bullish on oil. I'm bullish on platinum and palladium. Uh, probably more palladium than platinum right now. And I'm bullish on other kinds of energy production. Oil prices are going through the roof. That's going to happen. Gas prices are stuck, but that won't happen for long. So I've built an alternative energy company called Altera Power because I really believe in the future of clean energy. Wind power, hydropower, geothermal power, and I've built my Altera Power company to take advantage of what I think is a long-term trend towards clean energy for all governments, all countries, getting us away from our carbon-dominated electricity supply. I think it's a long-term business that will do very, very well. I don't like... I don't like coal, I don't like gas, because I think there is a lot of gas short term, say three to five years, it's gonna be a very constrained market. I don't like lithium, I don't like most rare earth elements, most rare earth elements are not rare at all, they're very, very abundant, and I don't like aluminum. Molly, molybdenum, I'm sort of neutral on. I'm neutral on molybdenum, I'm neutral on nickel, I'm neutral on zinc, and I'm neutral on lead. So that's a little swing through commodities that I like, and they're, they're driving my business, I have you know, I have four companies that are public today. I've got Pan American Silver. I'm the chairman of that company. It's the world's second largest silver mining company. It's a wonderful company in fantastic condition today. We have uh, Lumina Copper, which is a dis has discovered the world's largest uh, discovery, uh, copper discovery last year in Argentina. And we're now taking that company to what we hope will be a happy ending this year, quite soon, in fact. 
Uh, we have, I mean, it's a giant deposit, and it's going to be a, it's going to be a, uh, it'll be a wonderful deal. And I think anybody who's a shareholder of Lumina Copper will have a, have a, ha pretend you don't own it. Just don't look at the share price, and you're going to wake up one day, and you're going to be happy. That's my prediction on Lumina Copper. And Anfield Nickel is pretty much the same thing. Anfield Nickel is a nickel project in Guatemala, an enormous thing. It's probably the largest undeveloped nickel deposit in the world today. It's fully de risk We've taken it to resource. We've taken it to preliminary economic assessment. And now we're looking at, uh, at doing a, a divestment to a major company this year. We actually would have done it last fall, but we caught the, the bear market in, in, uh, in, in attitudes of steel companies to, uh, to the future. And a lot of that's reversed now because it's, it's kind of party time again. And so we've, we're confident we'll have, a, we'll have a happy ending on Anfield Nickel this year. And as I said, I also have my clean energy company, Altera. So that's what I'm invested in. Uh, it's worked very well for me. It's been a happy world the last uh, 10 years. And uh, I think it's going to be happy for another 10 or 15 years. So there you have it. That's why I'm bullish. Thank you.